I don't fly. Yeah. It freaks me out. Uh, we have a church member here who the first conversation I had with him when I told him I was afraid of flying, he, he works on airplanes. That's his job. And I said, yeah, I'm really afraid of, like, I do not enjoy flying. It's, it scares me. He said, it should. That's um, comforting. I know, because he, he says he's not flown commercially since 9-11. Oh, my word. Bro, I did not need that right now. <laughs> yeah, I didn't need that. He, yeah, he has, ju- like, he theological reasons for why he doesn't want to fly anymore, what? too. Are we talking about mm-hmm, that guy? Yeah. LXX. He's what? like, <laughs> what'd you say? LXX. Oh, sorry. <laughs> he's, yeah, he's like, he, he is now known as Septuagint. We've talked a lot about <laughs> how he, as the world and really our culture gets more and more godless, that he's like, pilots are less afraid to do stupid things. Yeah, I don't need to hear that right now. We can sorry. talk about this when I get back. <laughs> Maybe we can't. Okay. <laughs> I was going to say should, it. Maybe we should get it all out of the way now. I love you, man. I love you. Uh, <laughs> Do you want to bequeath some things? What happened, on, what happened on Twitter where people were giving their eulogy for me? Oh, I spilled coffee uh, on my coffee yeah, I spilled on coffee on my comforter. I do uh, not want your books. <laughs> don't want them. I don't want your Q&As. What are you talking about right now? Can I have your whiteboards? <laughs> I'll split those you can take that you. up with Charles. <laughs> I want that cool <laughs> prop two desk over there that I love. This you love it, yeah. No, you, you can't have that. That's what I mean. You, honestly, it goes to Haddon. Oh my! <laughs> Imagine that little man. <laughs> <And> all, <laughs> he's all pushed up. All this theological <laughs> reading. He's <laughs> little, been doing. little hand with writing with the with, you come with in, my fountain like, pen. What are you doing? I'm using my desk. <laughs> 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 and he's still nine months old in this. He in this is. Picture. <laughs> he is. But he has like perfect handwriting, and he's using well pen. Right. But he's dipping it. He's moved on. It's like a quill. You, yes, a quill. you were too modern with your pen collection. That's fair. Oh That's fair. In the spirit of dad, I'm using a quill in this <laughs> well here. Of dad. <laughs> he writes his own catechism for his own peer group. <laughs> Who does? Ca- Haddon does? I love it. Oh my gosh. I love it. I'm having to dumb this down. <laughs> for the children <laughs> for those whose father is not lost in Harlow alright I'm gonna do the entry and then we can troll so. hold on I think you should use the words installment bro I'm not, not doing show. it show what would be another word it would be um, an installment you can you can you can pick the tone of my voice that's all you can pick welcome <laughs> alright to products of grace a podcast you just wanna do it by Mercy Hill Church you're doing it right now so we're just we would like to welcome you to another installment featuring our guest, Dr. Josh Howard. <laughs> <laughs> now do the real intro. I feel like the Olympic music should be playing right. instead of our actual. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> All right, I'm just going to do the welcome now. And we, sorry. Welcome to no. product. Well, I just messed <laughs> up. <laughs> All right, hold on. <laughs> Welcome to Products of Grace, a podcast by Mercy Hill Church. My name is Lawson Harlow, and with me today, I have Don Terrell and Blake McCullough and the good doctor, Dr. Josh Howard, henceforth known as Dr. Josh. So, Don, what are we doing today? So today, what are we doing today? Today, we will discuss the title of today's episode is... Seems a bit of an overreaction, <laughs> but okay. <laughs> <laughs> Which flows from a text message conversation yeah, that I had where I was... About you being post-mill. Yeah, I was having conversations <laughs> with, uh, with Josh about a couple things. Dr. It, Josh. Dr. Josh, sorry. Dr. Josh about some things. We need to get you a hat. I don't know what kind <laughs> of hat, but I want you to have a hat, Josh. A doctor's hat. The doctors have hats. Are you ever going to let him speak? In a minute, I am. <laughs> um, He's not actually. This is what I got in trouble for last <laughs> yeah. time. So, so, and I and he said, I can't be friends with you anymore if you're going to be post mill. And I said, Who said that? Uh, our, our producer. producer. Yes. And he said, and he said, and I said, Hey. That might be a little bit of an overreaction, but okay. <laughs> and then Don says, that's the title of the podcast. Yeah, nice. we Which I think it really will capture <clears throat> the spirit of the episode. Nice. Yep. Yeah. So Josh, welcome. Thanks. Good to be back. So you came from? Michigan. Yeah. Which is not the North. I've been told it's the Midwest. Seriously? Really? Yep. Yeah. What's, What's the North? Is then? it not literally? I guess, I guess Canada. Because <laughs> it's, 
Michigan's the oven mitt, right? Yeah, Michigan's the oven mitt, but you've got the UP, the Upper Peninsula. And as I understand it, that's the north. Um, and and the, everybody there. else is just, you know, we're the trolls because we live below the bridge. So we're in mm. the southern part of the state. Doc, you're going to put your Midwest. mouth on that mic. <laughs> Which is the Midwest. There you go. Doc, Sorry about that. Wisconsin. Um, unless I'm about to show that I'm geographically. <clears throat> you uh, didn't even know where Holly Springs was. Uh, yeah, I still don't. But if I'm not mistaken, Wisconsin is attached to a, to a part of Michigan. Kind of. That shouldn't belong to Michigan. Yeah, it, it has something to do with Toledo, yeah, apparently. All I'm saying is it seems as though Wisconsin, like the people of Wisconsin are not real Americans. Because if they were... That would belong to Wisconsin now. Okay, they would have they would have conquered it, and it would conquered. belong to them. It was part of Canada. They did bring us saying? Culvers, mm. so you know respect where respect is due. What's Culvers? Oh my word! What's Culvers? Chicken, right? Oh my word! No, no, no! It's like donuts. A, no burger joint. Oh, they burger have like fried right. cheese curds and butter burgers. Yeah, this is how you keep What's warm. A burger. It's how you keep warm in the winter up north. I mean, not in up north. Midwest. Excuse me, up in Midwest. Thank you. <laughs> so, what's the city you're nearest to in Michigan? We're in Battle Creek, so we're South Central, so we're about equidistant from Detroit to Chicago. Oh, about okay. About two and a half hours, give or take. Nice. I just remembered that Detroit was in Michigan. Yeah, it is. The Rust Belt, dude. It is. It is both of those things. Mm. We're about we're about an hour and 15 south, uh, southeast of Grand Rapids, and most people know where Grand okay. Rapids is. So. so for those that might just be tuning in, how are you connected to these us yeah no so um <laughs> the south the, the south is more or less home uh we we served in ministry here for about a decade in the kind of mid-south area um i went to seminary with lawson uh lawson shamed me in class over philippians 2 and i'll never forget what? it what i don't oh, remember yeah. this at He's all oh, i thought we talked about this no no lay it yeah, out lay it out hey, so, hey, so lawson you have to say it uh, so, so lawson, lawson. Yeah. yeah so so <laughs> I'm sorry. Your customs are strange to me. So Lawson. So Lawson. No, we were there in class and I was bringing up because I was, I mean, anyway, God, God did a pretty radical transformation in my life in my late twenties. And so I'm in seminary and this is like, I'm like 30. And, uh, and I was mentioning, I said, yeah, I think there's a passage that talks about, you know, Christ having, you know, in some way set aside, um, in his incarnation. And I'll never forget. You were like, it's Philippians two. <laughs> and it wasn't like rude or anything, Chapter but it was just, it was almost like the undertone was like, of course it's Philippians two. And now that I look back, I'm like, well, duh, duh, Josh, that was Philippians two. But at the time, all I could think of was like, I will never know my Bible. It's sufficiently for this man. Like th- he is, <laughs> I, is so untrue. I am not yet on the first la- rung of the ladder, you know, what do we call um, you? You're the litmus test for what? Orthodoxy. Orthodoxy. <laughs> the, um, I don't remember that. Mm. My, my first, don't. my first, like my first, like actual, cause you sat behind me in, I think it was, it wasn't, it wasn't systematic theology, but it was a Mahoney class. Yeah. I think it was maybe historical theology. I don't even remember. Um, because I remember him going through like covenantal grit. Oh, it was biblical theology. It was biblical That's theology. What it was, yeah, it was yeah, the yeah. first one that he had taught in yep. a long time. Um, and you were sitting behind me, and at the time, like I, we talked before class for a couple minutes. But then uh, Marcy was uh, having y'all's third or fourth child. Yes. And, yep. you, and and that was, I mean, that was when I got to know you really more in prayer because I was yeah. praying for your family. Yeah, that's our fourth fourth and final yep. yeah yeah and then um i forgot about that yeah and then we picked back up again probably when um when you were working through like moving to an elder model somewhere else and we met right. at, we met it i mean we met at the starbucks yep um by the tanger tanger how do you say that tanger yeah. tanger um me you and sean yeah who's now in france who's now in france yep. and so yeah he's still and he's uh, we we joke because the reality is that you can call a lot of pastors and norm- normally like when you t- call them, they're not always super excited to have a theological conversation with you. It makes me sad. Mm-hmm. And so Josh and I will call each other because we actually are always ready to have a theological conversation. Absolutely. Like, it's it's the highlight of my that's month right, when right. Lawson pops yeah. in and, hey, what do you think about this? Yeah. Love it. And then the last time I did it, he he messed with me. Why do you think that is that the spirit within the pastor community is I think it's an aha got you. Would what? you think so? Like, there's not like free flowing, like, hey, what do you think about this? Because everybody's always scared to be like, that they're going to get big boyed. Yeah, that you're the boogeyman. Mm-hmm. So they're going to get Philippians too. <laughs> <laughs> you just say they're going to get Lawsoned. <laughs> Ow. 
Wow. <laughs> I don't I don't know if that's it. That, I, I it think, might be. I think there's it, it's fair that there's a certain level of intimacy. That's if fair. I can use that word, yeah, that, that kind of comes with it. You've got you've got to kind of bury your your soul a little bit. Um, you know, I have some pastors in my area, and we just had. Well, we've been having an ongoing what we were calling a napkin conversation because of a terrible illustration I used with a napkin. But, um, but yeah, I mean, they, they, you're you're kind of opening up in a very in a very real way that you probably don't want to. Mm. It's conversations you wouldn't necessarily want to have in front of your congregation, right? Because you're really yeah. just kind of. But opening that's what we're up. about to do, right? <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. I think people appreciate the honesty. Well, yeah. that, was, that was kind of my intention of this, um, because Th- this being what this podcast. No, no, no. I mean, we we know this exists, but this episode. Well, this episode is working through. Okay, why is it that I am where I am, and could I be somewhere else? Right. Like, I think. I think the. Do you think that some of the audience listening will say, "I think that's a bit of an overreaction," <laughs> but okay, because that's where I the think, title. I think came one, from. Did. <laughs> one did. One um, did, but. But so all that to say, I think it's helpful. Like, let me, I can preface the whole conversation by saying I have not moved my position on eschatology. And I think you can confirm that. Like you, you, Dr. Josh can confirm that. Because if if I have conversations about eschatology, I normally start with him. Um, Just because he literally wrote a book. And this is, I mean, this is, you spend a lot of time talking about this. I've watched, uh, last night I watched a couple of your Eschatology Matters, which on that YouTube channel, mm-hmm. the most recent one, which was like, it was the, the name of the, to- the name of the episode was wrong. It was like seven, seven things that, uh, that don't divide. Yes. Yeah. The, the, but, the, but the, the name, title was yeah, seven the things that do divide. Yeah. The title was wrong. Yeah. But, but the conversation. I don't, I don't do any of that. Yeah. But the conversation but, was good. Yep. And yeah. so, um, so where do you think? Hold on. Yeah, go ahead. Where do you think this conversation falls within the order of dogma, doctrine, discussion? Let's let the let's let the expert okay make the statement. So dogma, non-negotiables. You know my you know my oh, dogma, for sure. dogma. Yeah, first, second, third tier type, yeah. type yeah. Of situation. Um, we're talking eschatology. I'm assuming I can yeah. I can jump into that. Yeah. Um. So in general, third tier. Um. But with first tier implications. Absolutely. So if you're if you're a full preterist, you're you're all the way you're all the way past first year. Right. Yeah. yeah so yeah. It, it it's hard because you know when you're talking about eschatology, typically you're talking about the end of things, and so how we arrive at certain conclusions about the end of things in in so much as like how is God going to consummate this great story? We could have disagreement on. I see a you know pre tribulational rapture. Those type of things would be third tier, right? Mm-hmm. But if you're talking broad eschatology, mm-hmm. will the dead be raised? Will Christ vindicate the saints and judge the wicked? Will Christ descend bodily? Uh, from heaven, like those are first tier issues. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean that that's what makes it kind of hard with eschatology because typically you're not talking about those things unless full preterism enters the conversation. Typically, when people in a church are talking about eschatology, it's like, do you like Left Behind or are you re- <laughs> you so know true. like it's it's mm-hmm. it's something yeah. that I would say no, we can still have fellowship on this. Although, let's talk through it. Although yeah, you're a but, weirdo. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, what are the labels that are used? Like, what are those labels? Because you're saying within labels. eschatology, yeah, you're saying full preterism. Yeah, give labels and brief Definitions. descriptions. So the 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 two broad labels in my mind would be, be premillennial and postmillennial eschatologies. Fair. Um, so there are postmillennial eschatologies of which you could divide that into postmillennial, which I know it's hard to name something within a category with the same name, but the Presbyterians have done it with Presbyterian ecclesiology. But anyway, that topic for another day. So you got postmillennial theology, which in general says that Christ is going to return postmillennial reign after the millennial reign. Within that camp, you have postmillennialism and amillennialism. And we could talk about some of those differences, differences, which is where we're really going. But if I could say this, for sure. So you would say, and I think historically, right, you amillennialism has been it's inside of the post mill. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. They're both they're both part of a post mill schema insofar as Christ returns post millennial. Right. Which is which is confusing for a lot of people, because, again, the moniker amillennial, people think that that indicates that they don't believe in a millennium, which is not accurate. Um, on the other side, you have premillennialism, which could be then subdivided into dispensational premillennialism and hi- mainly historic historical premillennialism. And premillennial is just Christ comes before pre the millennium. Mm-hmm. So both of them are schemas addressing when Christ returns and then what the particulars of that look like. So when you say th- this is this is a question I get all the time, so I'll let you answer it. Um, what's when you say so we got premill, postmill, amill being somewhere in the middle here. Did you get? You lost your headphones. 
Well, that's not good. Oh, it's because Blake kicked it and unplugged it. <laughs> wow. That's rude, Blake. Um, <laughs> Blake said, you're done here. <laughs> Blake wanted some mic time. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but so that? the um, so so you got pre, you have post, you have ah. Uh, so obviously there's a there's a common denominator here, which is millennium. Mm-hmm. So when you're speaking of the millennium, but just, you have pre, post, and then within post you, you have, have ah, yeah, post and ah, right, yeah. But but nonetheless, this is this is why I'm going to ask him to clarify. Right, when you say millennium, what are you making reference to specifically? The thousand year reign of Christ. Okay. Yep. Is that so, literal for you or figurative? Well, hold, on, hold on, we're not there. Oh, <laughs> sorry, I. We're not there. I thought we were just having a conversation. We're, we're, we're we're just, it's a good, it's a good question. No, we're defining terms. Yeah. We're defining terms. And the thousand year, obviously, if you're if you're looking to define it, most people would look to Revelation 20 verses one through, we could say 10, or, yeah. or, but mainly one through six, and where uh, the millennial reign is specifically mentioned. But you've got other reference in scripture mm-hmm. to, a, to a millennial reign of Christ. Okay, now you can ask your question. Go. You didn't, you, <laughs> Literal yeah. or what was the other term you figurative. used? Figurative. Literal or figurative. Um, literal in the sense that that uh, scripture wants it to be literal. So reading it with reading it with the intention of the original author, reading it with the genre, within the genre that it's written in, literal in that sense. So when when Christ says that He is the door, when Christ says that He is the light, we take that literally, and yet we also look to the the meaning behind that. So when we read mm-hmm. a thousand year, which is where you get the word millennium from. Um, when, we, when you read of a thousand year reign of Christ, we're looking at it as a literal thousand year reign of Christ, which does not necessarily take exactly 1000 earth years, mm-hmm. because I don't think that's what it's aiming at. I think it's it's aiming to speak of something that is long in duration and that has a has a sense of completeness to it, mm-hmm. which is very in keeping with the way prophetic and apocalyptic mm-hmm. literature is written. Mm-hmm. So literal, yes. And that's typically one of the barbs against if you're looking at those two big categories of premillennial and postmillennial. Typically, one of the attacks against postmillennial theologies or eschatologies is that it does not take the Bible in a literal fashion. Um, I would just say that that, that that that's that's not exactly fair to say that something's not literalistic. Um, there, there, there's such a thing as a wooden literalism that can be applied to the text, mm-hmm. forcing something into a what we would consider literal category that does not fit the way Scripture is communicating that mm-hmm. thing. Um, and 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 if you were to think of this, none of us read the Bible consistently literally insofar as we're taking every analogy from scripture and trying to apply it. Mm -hmm. You know, I brought up Jesus as the door. Like someone would laugh you out of church. If you said Jesus is a door, like Mm -hmm. a literal door, Mm -hmm. but nobody's going to balk at the fact of you saying, no, that's actually speaking of a Mm -hmm. much greater reality that it's pointing to. Well, that's not literal in the sense that, that, that we might apply it, but it's definitely literal in the sense. That's what scripture is communicating. Yeah. It's conveying a deeper meaning. Yep. So yeah. you don't want to stretch that too far, right? Like you don't want to just take things and say, oh, there's there's a deeper hidden meaning behind everything and wander into some sort of Gnosticism right. with scripture. Fair. But you also don't want to just take everything with a wooden literalism mm-hmm. that robs it mm-hmm. of the meaning. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So wait, uh, Blake, what are you? <laughs> are you are you? Are you pre? Or I think post? I, I think I turned Blake a little bit at lunch uh, while um, we were at the SPC. You think you turned Blake? <laughs> I really did. <laughs> Julie was so on your head about your dining. I should be all right. <laughs> yeah, deservedly. They're mad so. at me because we went to New oh, Orleans. Oh, I heard. I, I heard, don't... and I was disappointed. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. You know the food they have to eat in yes. New Orleans. Now, from what I understand, there was a lot of dodging public spectacles involved in going to but food in New Orleans life. this year. That's but life. no, it's not. No, we it's did not. not experience that. Oh my! All right, and Julie this said, "Hold on, hold on." Julie said, "If I was Blake, I would have literally." <laughs> Ties in, fellas. <laughs> Left him by himself. I thought about it, bro. That's it, bro. I'm going in. You like, did the not. Dude, I'm about such a. Me. I am such a like. What's the word? Uh, I like to be around people. Yeah, you're an intro. I would have been so sad eating by myself. <laughs> <laughs> Even though the food would have been serial killer at the booth like, in New Orleans. It doesn't matter. Like if yeah. the food was great, I was sitting by myself. I've been so sad. And mm-hmm. Julie also said, "I would have taken his phone and turned it <laughs> off." And he would have gone to bed. <laughs> so anyways. Man, I've walked into something in this one, haven't I? <laughs> Bro, if you walk in here, you're walking into something. Uh, Answer his question. Hold on. So let's in your find two out. Buckets. Hold on. Okay. Let's find out in the rest of this episode. If we're goaded into laughing, what's or if happening we kick right now? against the goads? There's an idiom here. Oh my we're goodness. Goading. Just start. Just answer his question. Like. Uh and if you're talking about the two buckets, I'm in the post bucket. Which the vast majority, so like we've, we have been professing amillennialist P 
period. Th- uh, as far as I know, right? This I love is the tribal we're... language. <clears throat> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, we we are. We're yeah. in agreement on 90% of doctrines, yeah. right? Who? The three of us? The three of us, right? And what, are, what bucket are you in? Post. Okay. Did y'all just put me outside the camp? No, you're... Man. You told me some things earlier today. I hear you. Fair, um, fair enough. <laughs> fair enough. <laughs> no, nah, I kid. Uh, and Lawson, your Part- post. <laughs> huh? Do we want to ask Josh or we just want to wait and let it unfold? I want to I unfold a little bit okay, here. Yeah. Okay, so... Cliffhanger. If we're so, talking buckets, I'm clearly in the post. Yeah, bucket. absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's that's kind of where I am. Right. And I would, so, I would also yeah. point out. I mean, and I, I know this is kind of a controversial point, but I think it bears out pretty clearly. Um, the majority of the church's preponderance for 2,000 years has been post. Yeah. There's been a lot a lot of ink spilled on the early church having sounded very premillennial. I would just encourage anybody read Regnum Calorum among other works. Um, it's not quite as clear cut. Their their categories were not nearly as. Uh, sussed out maybe as we would like them to be in modern terminology so um yeah so and i think that's actually really helpful because one of the one of the normative arguments in in most most uh theological debates today is is tell me about the history of it right and while i appreciate tell me about the history of it i i I really sincerely do not like to make my dogmatic arguments from history especially in regard to eschatology because the the number one thing i see happening with both a pre-mill or a post-mill, even if that falls into the ah-mill camp, is, yeah, but look at the history of the world. And it's like, I, I this is not the best way to do this. Um, and I mean, I think we can all agree that if we're doing eschatology with our newspaper in our hand and that being an authoritative source, I think we're doing it... Uh, a un- major disservice. Yeah, yeah, Amen. certainly. Hmm. Um, okay, so <clears throat> we we have... Sorry, go ahead. No. What were you about to say? I think it's a moment in time, Blake, where you and I fade to the wings. Yeah, that's I agree. And I'm going to turn <clears throat> over the, the reins, reins of this podcast mm. to our dear You're friends. Pass the rock to the point guard. Amen. Stop it, Josh. The I'm actually going to go get a cup of you. water. <laughs> <laughs> hey, do you want to run and get some food? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll be right back. <clears throat> so, so we we have all been, I think, safe to say, optimistic uh, millennialist, mm-hmm. right? So do me a favor. Let's let's split the difference here. So run through the distinction between the pessimistic amillennial view, which seems to be more normative if you if you profess amillennialism. Mm. Um, run through the distinction between, if if you can, from the 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 pessimistic view and the optimistic view of mm. amillennialism. Because here's what I want to get to. I'll tell you where I'm going. I want to know where the line is between optimistic amillennialism and post-mill the way that that most people mean it today when they say it. Yeah. Is that fair? Mm-hmm. All right, so let's make the distinction between pessimistic, optimistic. Yeah, and I'll resist <clears throat> the urge to make a bunch of caveats and disclaimers at the beginning because... <laughs> yeah, just, let's just go ahead and say we're broad brushing. Yeah, broad, broad brush strokes. Brushing. And, okay. But also, I, I would say I, I'm a little frustrated with with the the negative reactions to using terms like pessimistic and optimistic if we can just be real real candid if 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 your view of of redemption is that the church is going to shrink into an ever ever decreasing minority and that it's essentially going to be the persecuted you know 12 people left on the planet and then christ returns in victory we're all optimistic in the sense that christ triumphs let's just set that one to the side we're christians christ wins yes but it's a it's a bit nonsensical to not say that that's a pessimistic view of the church's triumph in this age or Fair. in this world. That's what we're talking about. So I've seen a lot of people push back and say, no, there is no actual pessimistic eschatology. That That's just uh, to, to me, that's a, just a splitting hairs a little bit. Um, so, yeah, w- when you're talking about the and, and that kind of leads into what you were saying. So within a millennial thought. Um, a millennialism would say then that there is a millennial reign that it lasts from Christ's first to second comings, essentially. I don't know where you exactly split that within the first coming. There may be a little disagreement. There's nuances within all these. So let's right. just broad brush strokes again. Christ's first to second coming is the millennial reign. Uh, a millennialism typically says that is a spiritual reign. So when Revelation, for example, talks about the saints reigning on the thrones, this is a description of a heavenly reality, a spiritual reality. Christ is reigning, but he is reigning through our hearts and through the redemption of his people. Um, there's not a whole lot of this worldly influence. Now, of course, if you have a bunch of Christians running around doing Christian things, there's probably going to be some good things that come from it. Right. But that's not an expression of the actual kingdom, <clears throat> per se. Um, so the kingdom then is a spiritual reality. So the difference between pessimistic and uh, and optimistic amillennialism then would be what are what is the growth of that in this age? So 
is the church going to expand? Are there going to be probably a lot more people saved in the end in the final analysis, if I can steal from R.C. Sproul? So like when you look at the final analysis, will we expect more people to be saved than are lost? That would be an optimistic amillennial view. You're still saying it's primarily a spiritual triumph. And yet in the end of things, we're going to see a whole lot of people saved uh, through the ministry of the gospel. A, a pessimistic view would say, no, we're going to shrink and shrink and shrink, and there's going to be very few that are saved. Broad is the the, the road, right. and yet narrow is the path to, that leads to <clears> salvation. <throat> so we can expect a very small amount of people to be saved. That's typically the broad brushstroke of amillennialism with, post, with uh, pessimism and op- optimism. And again, to me, that seems a bit of a pessimistic view. And right. that's okay. If, if Scripture susses out a, a pessimistic view, embrace that and say, yeah. no, we have pessimism in this age, but we have optimism in the fact that Christ is going to return and redeem us. That's fine, right. but it would be pessimistic in this in this world. Yeah, so to, to build that out, you, you cited... Um you cited the verse that makes reference to to the narrow road, mm-hmm. right? And the narrow way, not many are going to find it. Do you see that text as an actual indication of numerical, like how many people will actually come to, like percentage wise, right? Mm. How many people are going to come to saving faith? Do you think that's a trump card? So I, I, I prepared myself for this conversation by being obnoxious on Twitter. <laughs> Um, that's what I, I, I saw that. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, I, I'm here for it. So that's how you prepare yourself for most <laughs> right, every day, right? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, I'm sorry, you just I, lobbed it up. I, I know, I know. I know it, it was, it was, it was hard. <laughs> you know your role <laughs> to say I'm here to say mm, and jab at Lawson. Okay, so <laughs> that so one of the normal normal views I heard in regard to embracing a more pessimistic view of amillennialism is that oh, what well, seems as though the church is going to shrink. Even Sam Storm's whole argument is that the church will be smaller, but the concept is the darkness will be darker and the light will be lighter. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, do you think there's a biblical case? I, I would almost say one way or the other. Uh, no. Do you think there's a biblical case for the pessimistic view, meaning a shrinking of the church. Can I can I can I add one caveat to that? Yeah. And why does it matter? Oh wow, you're both looking at me for that. Well, I thought that was going to I, Lawson. I, um Yeah, I'm well I'm 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 here to learn, Josh. No, no, no. So why why does it matter if we believe Dr. the church Josh. will <clears throat> grow and expand and that it will be like leaven working through the lump and it'll be like you know, the tree that stretches over the planet and yeah, like the versus glory, the pessimism, the right? glory of the Lord covering the earth as the waters cover the sea. How much water, versus, how much water covers the sea? A lot. Yeah. Versus uh, the perspective that we lose down here um, and all the attendant uh, Thank you applications that, the thereof. You're welcome. So, it, I mean, why does that matter? So like in one way you could say, well, I'm pan millennial. It's all going to pan out in the end. Christ is going to be victorious. And in that I rejoice. Yes. And amen. And yet it really matters if God tells us how he's going to win, that we extol that yeah. not only because it glorifies God among his creation, but it helps us to love him when we see him doing mighty and wondrous things. So, so for example, if you were to think to the early church, would it have mattered for a persecuted minority hiding in the catacombs with their loved ones being torn apart in the Colosseum? Would that have affected their day to day Tuesday afternoon Christianity to know? Yes, we're in the we we seem to be losing down here. And yet Christ is actually going to bring triumph through this world, not just when he returns, but also we're going to see explosive growth by what not maybe in my lifetime, but generations down the road will see Christ triumph in this world. That's not just that's not just ivory tower academician talk or it shouldn't be right. Like this is deeply uh, pastoral, personal, devotional fair. It's nothing to be mind. willy-nilly about. No, mm. no. Okay, so back to the question. Yes. Is, is there, I mean, I think you answered it by arguing for the other position, but um, but in regard to the pessimistic, like if there's a key text to go for, to argue for the for the pessimistic view that the church is right. going to dwindle, I'm trying not to jump ahead. Um, what what would you go to? What would be the defense there? Well, I mean, that that's <clears throat> one of the ones, so, so two of the ones that I've seen cited at least recently um, have been, my kingdom's not of this world. And also, you know, narrow is the way. So you've got two passages that are speaking of redemption. Right. Um, and, and and again, it's really hard to proof text with this sort of thing because you're not talking about one text that just says, hey, by the way, the kingdom's going to grow in this manner. You're talking about like how you read the entirety of scripture. Right. Um, there, there's a lot that goes into this. But in general, like, yes, of course, there's a case to be made for a pessimistic view. I don't think it's a convincing case. And I think you have to stretch some of those passages. So, so for example, if you were to look at the one speaking about narrow is the way, I right. was always taught, growing up at least, and I don't even know who taught me this. It was just kind of how I how I heard things. 
was that this is referring to most people will not be saved, right? right? So narrow is the way. And then you read that passage and you're like, well, it doesn't seem like it's talking about a numerical number or, or a percentage thereof. It seems like it's speaking about the fact that it's really hard for sinful man to follow the way of Christ. In other words, like there, there, there is a, uh, there's a miracle in redemption through which God makes us love the things we once hated and to hate mm. the things we once loved in our mm. flesh. That's a difficult path, and it's far easier to follow that broad way. So it seems it's speaking about what that passage is about, which is redemption, right? Yeah. Like God works a miracle to make dead people come to life and to love his son rather than hating his son. It, all, it, also, it also would speak to the fact that even if you did apply it with a percentage or a numerical value, that's very true of the early church. <clears throat> narrow is the way, right? There's lots of passages in the New Testament that warn the early church that this is going to be pretty tough and you guys are going to look really small. Um, If you had to apply it, I would say it applies certainly to the early church. I don't think there's warrant for us to say this is going to apply in every generation of the church for the entirety of the church age until Christ returns. Right. I don't think that's in view in that passage. So again, like, is there a reason to take that from the passage? Well, sure. I just don't think it's doing the passage a fair shake as far as the, the context. For the pessimistic view, what do you think the backdrop of measurement is drawing from? What do you mean? Like, I think of the early church and everything that you just described, you know, hiding in the catacombs, your loved ones being torn apart in the right. Colosseum. Yeah. All the while, right, the promise was to the commonwealth of Israel. And yet they stumbled so that good news would go abroad. Mm-hmm. Right. Right. And so, I mean, Paul touches on this in Romans, like how how deep the wisdom of God is. And so I think I think of that backdrop. A lot of times my backdrop, my mean in which I'm measuring from is my current status, right? Like mm, mm. what I see in the world today. And I think there is been, I mean, it would be, it's hard to argue that there's not been an explosive growth of the kingdom of Christ over all creation versus that description that yeah. you just gave of right. a family in that moment in, you know, A.D., 70 ish. Right. Yeah, right. You pick up, you pick up one of those people and you drop them <clears throat> into our culture, like understanding like our culture has woes. Bar right. Nine. Even with all the you yeah. know, warts, but yeah. they walk down the street, like say they walk down church road, right? You're the very name, the very name. And, and there, and there's a, there's using the term somewhat loosely church. There is a church, you know, every what, three miles. Mm-hmm. And so like the, the fundamental distinction, not even talking about the fact that you've literally moved from one side of the world to the other, like the way in which the kingdom has expanded in that sense yeah. is Do you is think dramatic. that's a fair assessment to draw from? Do you think that's a distinction? A disti- you mean as far as like saying that... that yeah, like giving, informing your perspective that you have to have a historical perspective. Oh, yeah. And not just a perspective on yeah. modern times. It, it, and in two ways, I, I, I would answer that. So it, yes to your question. So like number one, like Lawson was saying, so, you know, we, we, we tend to take for granted the things that, that are blessings. So like we don't want to do newspaper analysis, but at the same time, like I can pull up my phone. I can pull up Greek texts from the New Testament on my phone right now. I can walk through, I can walk through countless uh, historians, theologians, Talking about those texts, I can have language helps like the, the amount of resources God has given his church right mm-hmm. now, even with all the craziness going on in the West yeah. is still a tremendous blessing. So I think there's a lot of value in that. The second thing, though, is I think that most Christians um, and again, I don't say this disparagingly. I know there's 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 men far smarter than I am who would disagree with me on eschatology. And so I'm not trying to just say everybody's just reading the Bible wrong. But I think that in general, when we get a pessimistic view from the Bible, it's because we are taking all of those instructions as a flattened linear equation to where we are today. Mm -hmm. So we read the New Testament. We say, look, they were being persecuted. Therefore, we should expect for all time this to continue. In essence, like there to be a flat trajectory. And I just don't think that's being fair to the the countless passages, especially in the Gospels, that talk about this thing's going to grow and it's going to look real small at times and then it's going to explode and then it's going to look real small again, you know, kind of pushed in upon and then it's going to explode again. Yeah, I think there's a lot to be said for that. You mentioned something, though, Lawson, and you and I have talked about this before as far as the kingdom of light and the kingdom of dark expanding. Um, I'm, I'm done with that illustration. Quite honestly, like the, the more I think about this and through biblical lenses, the, the argument has been made that the, that the kingdom of darkness will, in essence, grow alongside the kingdom of light. So light increases what's the name of this theological system. Well, I don't know the name for that particular okay, sorry, one. Never mind. Go ahead. It fits into a pessimistic eschatology, yeah, we could yeah. say, yeah. Um, where light grows, co- you know, coinciding with darkness growing. Um, 
the, I mean, we're in a zero sum game in this world. Like yeah. if there's light shining into this room, the darkness isn't going to shine darker. Like, no, right. the, the darkness retreats. <clears throat> the lights are on it. Yeah. That, that, that illustration, I feel like that's stretching that illustration far beyond what it can support. For, so for clarity, that's Sam Storm's illustration, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> and I and I, and I dearly I dearly love Sam Storms. Right? No, no, like I get. I just nothing. I just didn't want everybody to think you just took me to the woodshed. Oh um, no 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 <laughs> no. And, I, and it's I, payback for Philippians too. Yeah, that's right, so. that's right. That's right. That's right. I love and appreciate Sam Storms. I just I just don't think that I don't I don't think that illustration. And there's and it's it's not just from him for for sure. Like this has been. This yeah, it's a, norm, widely, it's a normative argument. Yeah, this has been yeah, widely propagated. Argument. I just don't think it bears weight. So yeah, I think I think John defeats it. Yeah. And John won. I think it's defeated. And yeah, like if there's, if there's yeah. light shining and the darkness yeah. does not overcome it, I, I, yeah. So, okay. So pessimistic view, uh, let's go to optimistic view. So if you're going to, if you're going to make a defense for the optimistic view of, 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 and we're sticking really with the amillennial camp. So there's, there's going to be a line here. That's where I want to get to. I want to get to the line between pes, uh, optimistic amillennialism and what's being communicated and, and, you know, advocated for in a, in a large number of circles of, of post mill. So like what's the what's the optimistic view of amillennialism and what are the biblical defenses of it? You actually already cited like most of the key text on it in yeah. rapid fire form, but go slower for for me. Yeah, I mean, so so it's amillennialism, so it's still putting a stress on the fact that the reign really most of these conversations in my mind come down to the kingdom of God. What is the right. kingdom of God? How does it expand? What does it look like? Where is it? Like th- those type of just key questions. And I think that would simplify it in a lot of people's minds. If you just like, okay, I'm getting lost in the weeds. They're talking about a lot of different stuff. It's just about the kingdom. Where is it? And what's it look like? So if you were to think of optimist millennialism, you're still saying the kingdom is primarily a spiritual, if not solely a spiritual reality. And I say that because again, um, I don't know many amillennial guys that would say if you've got 99% of a country running around, they're all Christians, you shouldn't expect to see some good things happening this worldly. Like there, yeah. there might be less murders. Hopefully there's less, you know, I, car you, thefts. Yeah, you, whatever. you almost can't say there will be. Less, right. There, there will be so, like, less there's, murders. There's effects. Well, yeah. I'm trying to be real. Yeah. Just like yeah. milk toast with yeah. this. Like we could expect to see some this worldly things. Right. But I think what's going to differentiate amillennialism and postmillennialism, postmillennialism is that's not where the kingdom is observed. Those are like, those are kind of accidental effects. And I'm using that in like the platonic sense. Like those are kind of accidental effects of the kingdom, but that's not actually the kingdom. Why? Because the kingdom is the redeemed souls of saints. It's a spiritual reality. Right. So I'm trying to remember what your question was. Oh yeah. As far as optimistic amillennialism before you go into. So optimistic amillennialism then would be yes. Kingdom of God, spiritual reign through the hearts of believers, Christ reigning on high. So there's the heavenly reality, but it's kind of this worldly in, only insofar as like th- there's the redeemed souls of those who God is saving. The optimism would come then in how many might come to saving faith. Right. And you're going to see a whole lot more people come to saving faith. Um, you could probably suss out a couple of other tenets of optimist, optimistic amillennialism, but that would be the primary feature, I would think. Will most people, will we see toward the end of history, whenever Christ is pleased to return, can we expect more to be singing around the throne than to be cast into destruction? And they would say yes. Yeah, that sum, summative enough. Yeah. Any questions y'all have on that that y'all want to bring in? Uh, I think of the verse like that. This that the salt. You're the salt and light. Yeah. And what does the salt do? It preserve. It preservative preserve, effect. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Is that what you're referencing? Is that that's not the main thrust of the kingdom? Is its preservative effect? But yet you can expect it to have a preservative effect. But the growth in the kingdom is spiritual through hearts being transformed by the gospel and that increasing exponentially over time. Essentially, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a pretty good summary. Because because if you were to say, as an amillennial, where is the kingdom? You would point to believers. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's, that's where the kingdom is. Where is the kingdom expanding? Well, it's expanding in the hearts of believers, but it is a heavenly spiritual reality. Mm. Um, which which I want to be fair here. I, I, I don't think most, most amillennial theologians would they're not trying to bifurcate the good word the sacred and the secular but many do um and this is where a lot of the for example two kingdom theologies have gone in my opinion very far afield so um some of the two kingdom perspectives are that there is define two kingdom yeah two kingdom theology is it's it's within the reformed camp um luther propagated it calvin propagated it it, and it's been widely disagreed on well augustine uh, propagated two kingdoms in his two cities model but um, a lot of the disagreement has been over what are those two kingdoms. So when 
you know, Augustine spoke of two cities. What was he talking about when Luther spoke of two kingdoms, which Luther went a bit a bit sideways on that when Calvin, more importantly, spoke of two kingdoms? What is he talking about? And many would bifurcate that between the sacred and the secular and say, ah, there is a sacred kingdom. In other words, we are citizens of the kingdom of heaven, which is a spiritual reality. Now, if you're thinking here, like I'm, I'm looking upward, right, like in the heavens, spiritual reality, there's the kingdom. So I'm a citizen of that. And yet, where do I find myself here? So I'm also a citizen of this earthly kingdom, the physical kingdom, the passing common kingdom. Um, I, I would just say that's pushing that that's pushing that far beyond, I think, what's biblical. Biblically, I see a kingdom of light and a kingdom of darkness, and I see you as a citizen of one or the other. Christ has saved us from the domain of darkness and counted us as children of the kingdom of light. So if we're looking at it from that perspective, you're only a member of one kingdom, and that kingdom is not separated to the sky. It's spilling out here into the creation, and I'm getting a little bit. Yeah, you a little bit far. Yeah, yeah I'm jumping. But that 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 is a feature of much amillennial scholarship. Not all, but much is a bifurcation between the sacred and the secular. To the extent that when we talk of the kingdom of God, it is a up in the sky. And I'm not saying that disparagingly, but like just think of it like up in the sky. It is a spiritual reality that is affected in the hearts of believers and yet does not enter into this world in a tangible sense. Good. <laughs> okay, so. To summarize, to summarize the the Amil view here, right? You've got the Amil who's who's pessimistic and and essentially number. I mean, in the growth of the in the growth of the kingdom in a spiritual sense, like is there going to be a is there going to be an explosion? Right? Well, it, it's it's pessimistic in number, but it's, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to walk no, in. No, was, but like fine. when you think of, for example, we all agree that there will be a point at which the yeah, glory of the yeah. knowledge of the Lord will cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. The pessimism comes in in how will that church, happen yeah. here? Yeah, exactly. And the amillennial answer in general would be no. Right. It will happen when Christ returns. Right. And so the even for an optimist, or we're saying that's that, that just, that's where the optimistic would come in a little bit. Okay. But again, though, you got to remember the optimistic amillennial is still having a little bit of the the kingdom is a spiritual reality which right. is fleshed out in the hearts of believers. So will the knowledge of the glory of the Lord? Yes, it'll cover the world as the uh, as the waters cover the sea. Because but we only, are here. Yes, only yeah. in the lived experience of the believer, mm. not necessarily in the culture that they impact. I love you, man. <laughs> like really helpful. Yeah. So, no. Oh yeah, that's where I'm at. Oh yeah, there too. <laughs> Let's find out if I'm wrong. So, <laughs> so okay, so Josh is like, open up, say ah. Uh. Okay, so, so the best. <laughs> wow. So the so the so the big short, if we're if we're identifying it right, if you claim to be an amillennial, you're gonna you're gonna ask the question. Okay, do I believe that there's gonna be more more Christianity, for lack of better terms? being in the culture, there's gonna be more soul saved. The optimistic view is to say that there's gonna be there's gonna be more Christians and there's gonna be a a further expanse of the kingdom mm. n- normatively in the hearts and in the lives of the believer. There's gonna right. be a deeper experience of those things and more people experiencing them. Yeah. Okay. And and to defend that because yeah. I know a lot of the pushback on this is like, well that's that's awful crass, right? Like that's awful crass of you to think of like numbers and how many and what percentage Surely the kingdom of God could be successful in this world if only 5% of the planet is converted in the end. Yeah. And I would just say, like, is that how you approach anything in scripture? Like, I'm not trying to be crass. I'm not trying to, like, go out there and force conversions. Like, we're not numbers people, right? I don't want churches packed full of unbelievers or anything like that. But if there was only five, if you're if you're being sanctified and I only see like one sin fall away and you're still up to your eyeballs in sin and your sanctification. Like, would I not have questions for you? Would we consider yeah. that success? Like, praise God, he stopped doing that one sin and he's still got this host of other sins that he's right. drowning in. Right. That's just, that That to me is not, it's not quite fair. Yeah, this is, this is always when people are asking about church health and we would, you know, I think we've been warned, like, don't give numbers. And it's like, no, 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 no. Like numbers are souls. Like these things matter. Like when we're looking at church health, the question of growth matters. Like, are there people being added? Like it's a sign of health to see life and to see flourishing and to see multiplication. Yeah. And so, I, yeah, I totally agree with that. So, so you're looking at it. We've, we've come up to the line of, of optimistic. You used a phrase that there's, there's some ramifications, right? So number one ramification is if, if, let's say the culture's 50, 60% Christian, right? There's going to be ramifications of that in society. There's just going yeah, to One be. would hope, yep. Um, yeah, certainly one would hope. To say, to say that the vast majority of a, of a, of a people are, are professing believers and aiming to obey Jesus and then say that that's not affecting the society at all is, is pretty damning, frankly, to the life of the individuals. And I would also just put in here, I don't want to like totally turn this sideways, but you're on the Twitter so you understand these, these the this debates raging right now is let's say you have 60% of a culture is Christian. In what sense should that culture be impacted? 
because a lot of the conversation right now is going 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 in these these regards. Should a Christian, as a Christian, support laws because they are Christian and because those laws reflect the Bible as a Christian text? In other words, should it be good if you have sixty percent of a society that is professing Christians, or let's say sixty eight percent of a society that's professing Christians, should you enact laws against murder not just because they're good for the societal value, but because God has said thou shalt not murder? And can you say that? as advocating for them as a Christian in that society. That's a huge debate on Twitter yeah. right now. And I'm not going to use all the terms, but you know, you know them pretty yeah, well, right? Yeah. So anyway, just thought I'd throw that out there. My phrase yeah. is we're always living in someone's theonomy. Amen. Don't, don't, don't tu- just, don't turn the shit. It is. Don't turn the shit. This is a different conversation <laughs> we're having later. <clears throat> Part two. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, okay. From there, you've got, you've got the optimistic, you used a phrase about, essentially the kingdom spilling over. Yeah. Right. And that the optimistic amillennial view may have a tinge of that. Yeah. Okay. So what then is the line? Like if, if you're to give a hard and fast line between the optimistic amillennial view as, as cited today, um, I understand that we can find somebody who disagrees with this somewhere in history and the post millennial view that's being, you know, I, I think I could even maybe say, um, revitalized to some mm. degree. Um, so like the, what's, what's the line, what's the hard and fast line between I'm a, I'm an optimistic on millennial to I am, I'm, I'm post millennial. Yeah. Yeah. In my estimation, um, without giving all my caveats and nuances and stuff, just, just, just to cut <laughs> to the chase, I think it's where does the kingdom of God come um, I'm I'm pretty convinced this is this is the dividing line. Where where does the kingdom of God expand? Where do we find it? Is is it in heaven or is it on earth as it is in heaven? And I'm not trying to just steal that from the Lord's prayer, but I do think this is one of the dividing lines. Is that um, no one in this argument? Which by the way, this is one of the common digs against a postmillennial eschatology. Is that um, it's something that's trying to be generated from the world? That's nonsensical. Um, right. we, we can't use we can't use common means to accomplish re, you know redemptive results. God has to change hearts of men and women. Only through redemption will will God achieve these results. But can we expect the kingdom of God not just to be a heavenly reality, but also to spill out into this world? In other words, could we see the effects in society, not just in families, but in culture, in society, in law? Dare I say, in like governance and nations, can we see the effects of God's kingdom there? Not as not as adiaphora that just happened to spill over from Christian people doing Christian things, but instead as the expression of God's kingdom expanding in this world. I, I think that is the primary uh, dividing line between amillennial and postmillennial thought is is it is a is it a spiritual reality alone? Which again, all the caveats in there, right? Yeah. But is it a spiritual reality alone, or is it a spiritual and earthly reality? The earthly as a result of the spiritual reality, and that would be postmillennialism. So I don't. Declare. Which, which, by the way, if if you're curious on this, uh, this Greg Bonson engages this as well. Yeah. Um, I know he's not everybody's cup of tea, but he makes this this point really clearly. I got, I yeah, go to, go go. So, do you think that the postmill position is that we are claiming? Uh, optimistic amils and optimistic amils are just confused and they're really post mill. <laughs> <laughs> oh my word. Um, I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> so, so here's, but here's the reality, right? So you and I, you and I talked, this was years ago. Mm-hmm. Um, you wrote a book that has not come out yet. I don't believe, which is on the, the great commission. No, wow. that one's been out. I, Okay, I'm a terrible friend. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yes, so, you are. Yes, so, you are. It's on record. I, yeah, I am a bad friend. Um, but I'm really, I'm really good when you need me, <laughs> right? Like, I may not call you to check in. Mail your books to this room. Do what? Yeah, he, he does. I've room. gotten, I've gotten. <laughs> that's, the books. The, that's the sad part. <laughs> yeah. I send them to the man's house, and he still doesn't even know they were published. <laughs> you didn't? I didn't get that copy. Did you not? No, I've never gotten that oh, copy. That's my I, bad. Then I would have, I would have actually read through that one quickly. Okay. Um, because I, because it was something that you and I talked about years ago. Like yeah. I was telling somebody, it was 2020 when this hit me, which is the Great Commission is conquest. Yeah. And I will tell you this right now. Yeah. So that's the theme. Great Commission is conquest. Yeah. Uh, I want to write a second version of that book already. There's so much there that I want to suss out, especially with this current conversation that yeah. I just did not have the page length to get into. Right. But, so so when you and I were talking about this, this was, I don't know, probably a year before you wrote that book. Right. 
And, and so like in our conversations, what we were kind of dealing with was the concept of, okay, if, if we're talking about the Great Commission and the way that it works itself out in society, well, the one thing we need to understand is it really is a command, a commission of conquest, of going in, making disciples and doing all that it requires of us. Right. The distinction between them that I think you made reference to already, which is it's not, it's not a, it's not as though we're naturally ushering something in, right? right? The conquest is the conquest of life, which is counterintuitive. But nonetheless, it's very clear that's what it is, right? Are you saying the kingdom is at war? Yes, I'm saying I'm saying that we are ever constantly like this is this is the Christian life. We're ever constantly aiming to do something. Mm-hmm. So what are we aiming to do? And I think that's really where the question of of what's the kingdom comes in because and, and this this is where I've like I, again I don't I don't I wouldn't say that I've that I've shifted my position. I think I'm perhaps like I, I've had maybe some blinders on blocking me some from from some peripherals. And, and they've kind of fallen off to like, okay, well, what am I, how, how does that work itself out? And I thought about it from spheres. You, you may have been, you may have been having blinders fall off, but there's also been a lot of conversation in this area yeah. within the last like three years, yeah, especially with, fair. you know, you already mentioned theonomy, but like the, in the, in the theonomy discussion, a lot of people have been clarifying lines that I quite honestly did not know were drawn where they are. Super fair. I thought I was standing with some people who have drawn lines. I mean, and I don't say that. They're not outside the camp. I'm not saying that. Don't mishear me. Eschatologically, though, right, right, right. I thought I was standing in certain camps where some in those camps have drawn the, or have clarified where they thought the lines were, and I'm not on that side of that line. Yeah, exactly. Which has been, which has been uh, interesting. Yeah, so that that's kind of one of the things that I've heard is I've seen some people come in and they're arguing for amillennialism, and they're on this side of the line. I'm like, I'm not with you. Yeah. Um, and I and I and never have been. Yeah. It's like, if that's the line that you're drawing, I can't go over there on that side with you. And, and to, and to be fair. So like a lot of the pushback here has been that, um, that many on the hopeful side of things, which that that's how I typically just describe my eschatology is just a hopeful eschatology or, or maybe a relentlessly hopeful eschatology. But, um, a lot of the pushback has been that it's not, it's not exegetical, right? Like it's yeah. not, this is a pie in the sky thing. Um, you know, you're you're just yeah you know, it's wishful thinking or you know uh, LARPing like you were talking about earlier right this is Christian LARPing um, one of the one of the primary passages I addressed in that that first book which was a uh, the exorcism of Satan one of the primary ones that jumped out on me was the uh, the binding of the strong man yeah right so it, it it and I feel like it's just one of the most neglected passages it's in it's in the synoptics but but Christ says that he came uh, to this world and that his coming was like uh, uh, like coming into the house of a strong man. So Christ is the invader. Yeah. There was a strong man who had a house, which is this world. The strong man's bad. Christ comes in. He says, I, I not only defeated him, I tied him up. And then I did what I wanted to with his house. I made it my house. Plundered. I plundered it. Right. Village. Yeah. I, I took what was his, um, which was not truly his. Obviously we, we have, right, our, we right, have our right. categories in mind, but he was there and he was running around and he was causing a ruckus. And Christ came in and not only tied him up and said, sit down. <laughs> but then he also took his stuff and I, I'm, I'm trying to make it really simple because to, to me, this is one of the most striking features is if that's the world. Yeah. And Christ has tied that guy up and taken his stuff and started making his house. His is it wrong of us to expect that we might see that in this world yep. we live in? Yep. This isn't his world. This is Christ's world. So and I understand. Sorry. Go ahead. So, so plundered and plundering. Yeah. Plundered and plundering and setting right. Yeah, he's cleaning up and redecorating the house that was the strong man's. It's not his house anymore. And and I think for a lot of us, we would read that and say yes and amen. And yet the house is going to look identical. And in fact, it's probably going to start to look like the strong man's back in charge for a long time, right up until the end. And then Christ comes back into the house. That's not the parable. Yeah, that's not the parable at all. He said, I'm ta- I'm riding this ship. So we look around right now and we see like Western society, you know, in a tailspin. You've got, you know, the SBC conventions trying to have. Um, trying to have their meeting and there's people running naked down the streets, right? Celebrating, celebrating debauchery and sin. And we look at that and we say, that doesn't look like the strong man's house has been, has been, uh, has been plundered. I think the strong man's actually in charge. And I would just say two things to that. Number one, historically it's short-sighted. Like we talked about, Mm -hmm. like there used to be literal Vikings running around this world, like kidnapping and pillaging and raping, like thing. Yeah. We could look at history and just say daylight. Right. Yeah. Um, but then secondly, I don't trust my eyes nor the perception of reality because there's been times in history where you could look around and say, man, it looks like Christ is losing right now. That's never and ever how we should do theology, right? right? That That's an improper way. I look to scripture, though, and I say Christ said he took the house and that he's making it his and that the strong man didn't in charge anymore. Yeah. And I expect to see those results. I don't yeah. think that's a radical view on eschatology at all. Yeah, I think I think really something you just hit on is where 
if we're if it, I'm trying not to jump too far forward here, but as you look around at the world, you can't assess or you should not assess Christ's victory by by looking at some sinful actions and being like, oh, well, since there's still sin here, that means that this isn't taking place, right. which is one of the normal arguments I hear. Or that a, that a society, one of, one of the arguments I hear from a historical perspective is, well, a society was transformed and then now it's not. Right. And those are and those are interesting arguments. I think those are you know we can have that conversation. But again, I don't find it to be an exegetical argument. Which mm-hmm. is like I, what I want to do is I want my view of the world to be informed by the Bible yeah. and not and not the not the other way around. Yeah. I, d- I don't want to look okay. at something. So you said you want to be informed by the Bible, right? So Josh, what do you do with the passage of "Woe to you, O Earth, for He has been thrown ta- thrown down, for He knows that His time is short." And also, I think in Revelation also uses that picture of that the woman was sent to the wilderness where she gave birth to the male child. She Revelation was given 12. wings. Mm-hmm. And but yet the uh serpent opened his mouth and water, you know, came out to pursue the woman, but the earth came to the aid of the woman and swallowed up. What do you do with all of that? Yep. So yeah, that's a that's a it's, number one, it's a really good question. And and number two, I think that I think that for a lot of people when they hear and I'm not saying this is you, but like this is what I've heard from others, right? I've heard from others that when you talk about a hopeful eschatology, they'll say, well, what of what of the passages in Scripture which maintain that, you know, Satan, his influence will persist, that his fighting against the saints will be fierce, um, and even that the fact that Satan, I think most of the millennial views agree, is going to be released at some point prior to Christ's return, yep. he's going to make a big ruckus, and then he's going to get squashed pretty quickly. Like, mm-hmm. that's Revelation 20, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so what do you do with that? No one, well, I say no one, I should always be careful with those words, um, no responsible theologian that I've read <laughs> writing from a hopeful eschatology has ever denied those things. Mm-hmm. So everyone would maintain that, yes, although Christ's kingdom expands, we can expect the fighting to be even more fierce, probably even more fierce than it was if it wasn't expanding. When I see fierce fighting against the kingdom, I view that mm-hmm. as kingdom advance. Like that's when the enemy fights the worst. You think of World War II, like when was the worst fighting of the mm-hmm. Pacific mm-hmm. campaign? It was when the, the Japanese troops were dug in on an island. They knew their end was secured. They mm-hmm. knew they were going to die. And they fought like mm-hmm. maniacs, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Like they're they're fighting for for, uh, for their lives in the face of defeat. Yeah, nature even shows you that when an animal's cornered. right, you corner yeah, a fox, yeah, yeah. right? Like what's going to yeah. happen? So, um, so that to me doesn't disprove it, and I'm certainly not not denying that. If if the if Christ's kingdom is is triumphing, and like we see a global revival, and there is countless scores coming to saving faith with all the attendant blessings from that. I expect the fighting to be even worse. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even right. if it's a minority that are still persisting in sin and rebellion, I expect them to be very angry about it. Yeah, Lawson, you use the words yeah. conquest of life. And I think like I always think of that in framed in victory. And yet when I think of kingdom at war, that there are casualties about, you know what I'm saying there? We do see yeah. bloodshed. We do see. Yeah. yeah I, I, you just see there is an enemy life. There yes, is an enemy. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the, 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 the beauty of the going back to that co- language of conquest of life is there are people who are enemies that will be made friends, but it doesn't change the fact that there are enemies. Right. Like just because we're going and, and, and preaching the gospel and seeing sinners saved doesn't mean that there are not, I mean, goodness, they're not family members who are infuriated right. that their loved ones have bowed the knee to Jesus. Yeah. Um, you know, I think there's, there's gotta be some, there's obviously warfare. And that was one of the mistakes that I had, I think in as, as I was thinking about this is it's like, well, no, no, no. Like I affirm Right, Satan's been bound, but in my language of saying Satan's been bound, I mean, goodness, y'all. It, but I preach regularly that we still have enemies, right? And so, like, and that hasn't changed. If if it was if it was a ne- if it was a necessity to say, oh, the world, the flesh, and the devil are not enemies anymore to 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 adopt a post mill position or even an optimistic on mill position, it's like nobody can do that, right? Mm-hmm. And you know, there's there's a dear Nor brother, they. Yeah. right? There's a dear brother who 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 spoke about. He was speaking, he used the term post-millennialism, but he was speaking of a hopeful eschatology. And he said, he said that we shouldn't expect, he said, there's Christians out there who expect to just waltz into the kingdom of God. Um, you know, that, that our victory is just going to be this seamless win that we're just going to waltz in there with no cares in this world. And that's when Christ is going to return, um, with all love to him. Like that's just not an accurate representation of what anybody is saying. 
um, e- even with the most hopeful eschatology. Well, let me give you an example. I just wrote a, 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 a article for G3 that they were kind enough to publish, but it was on suffering. And so I was kind of giving a little bit of a not a punch right, but just a little bit of a, hey, guys, let's make sure not to neglect suffering in, in the scheme of hopeful eschatology. Right. Because it's an important category. And I've heard some people the way they describe at the popular level their eschatology, you might wonder, do they have a category for Christian suffering in this world? Because, again, even with a majority, even with a great work of God, we should expect some pushback from those who are not converted. Um, those the, from the kingdom of darkness, so to speak. So anyway, I was doing some research on that and I realized I'm just thinking of two guys in particular, Greg Bonson and Ken Gentry or Gen- is it Gentry or Gentry? Gentry. Okay. Th- I thought it was, I've heard Gentry a lot and that threw me off. You live in Michigan now, bro. It, it, it's the Michigan pronunciation. It's the Dutch coming through. So, um, in the original Dutch, his name's Gent. No. Um, so Greg Bonson, Ken Gentry, um, Gentry in his book, he has an, an entire appendix dedicated to Christian suffering mm. and, and speaks much of with a very hopeful eschatology that Christ is going to triumph in this world. And yet speaking of until the time when Christ ushers in the eschaton, until things are made consummated in him, yeah. we should always expect some degree of suffering. Now, many of us have been spared it yeah. to, to, you know, to a lesser or more extent. But there's always going to be pushback. As long as there's sin that's extant in this world, we should expect these things. Yeah, I want to pause something because something you said uh let me go first. But does the world no, reflect no, that's that? Fine. Yeah, does the ahead. world reflect that? Because I also think of like when Christ says, you'll know, like you can read the times, right? Because you yeah. know, like wars and rumors, rumors of wars and famines. And uh, do you do you take that into account into your own view of eschatology as you're measuring like ha- ha- how we are progressing? Well, you're, so you're quoting Matthew 24, right? Yeah. Which, yeah. Which is that coming before the abomination of desolation? It is. Yeah. Which I believe yeah. is the destruction of the temple in AD 70. Yeah. I, th- I think the instruction for the... Do you think that the, that's not, that's not forward I don't, looking? I don't think we're supposed to look to wars and rumors of wars right now and try to forecast anything. Because there's okay. always wars and rumors of wars. All right. Yeah, so let they, me give you another They're passage. looking to like Luke 13. They were told mm-hmm. like, look around. You're going to see armies around mm-hmm. Jerusalem mm-hmm. run to the hills. So that was like a specific thing for them, I think. What do you think about Romans 8? That the, that the earth was not submitted to futility willingly, but in hope. And what is this futility that the earth has been submitted to is that she is in the pangs of childbirth, like For sure. groanings and the groanings will increase. For sure. How do you measure those groanings? I don't, I don't measure them as, as numerical defeat on the part of the church. So like, no, if, I'm not asking that. I'm saying like, is there a measure in creation? Put, put humanity out of it. Is there a decaying of creation up until the time the last trumpet blows? I'm just curious out of your own viewpoint. Like, I'm trying to follow the question, honestly. I'm not, I think I'm he's not trying to avoid it. it. I don't know. Are you... I, like Romans 8, it says right. like that creation was subjected to futility, right? Sure, sure, sure. And so what does that look like? It looks like the earth is pregnant at wait, awaiting the revelation of the sons of glory. Correct. Right, right. So are, are you asking essentially the world itself, like the actual nature itself? Yes. What role does nature itself play in a in a optimistic amillennial and postmillennial yes. view? Oh. I'm not sure how to answer that honestly well, I, because I'm so, not sure that I'm not sure yeah. that I would draw a distinction there between postmillennial and amillennial. So like if we if we consider nature like removing humanity out of it, which I would think that humanity is obviously the redemption yeah. of humanity plays a dominant role there in Romans eight. But but like looking to nature, like can we look around and see the thorns and thistles and observe the mm-hmm, creation? Mm-hmm. But I don't think that we should expect it, it's it's not like the thorns are going to recede. I'm not trying to be crass, but like it's not like the thorns are going to recede no, as the kingdom yeah. is triumphing. But I think we can see. So, for example, we we we, we referenced earlier. Maybe this will answer it. So like we referenced earlier. Um, that we have a lot of blessings right now. For example, like I can pull up on my phone Greek texts, mm-hmm. right? And I know that's not thorns and thistles, but is it a, is it a curse of this world that I am slow and stupid and mm-hmm. I'm prone to forget <laughs> things? Mm-hmm. Yes, like mm-hmm. that that that's part of my physical mm-hmm. groaning, mm-hmm. right? Like I can't think straight sometimes. My I, my my vision's cloudy, that sort of thing. Um, and yet, is it a blessing of God that? against that ignorance and against that slowness of mind, I've been given resources to engage God's word and to further explore it in a way that generations before us weren't. Mm-hmm. I think, yes. Um, in the same way, could we see, can, can we see physical benefits of God's kingdom expanding? My, my kids are usually, they, they play in our front yard and they're not, they're not worried of attack. 
right from marauders and stuff mm-hmm. i know we're bringing in the human marauders. element but at the same time like there's physical manifestations of the kingdom of god things look better so what do you extent. think about like the advancement of healthcare technology yeah, that's what all. i was about to go into okay. i think it's an absolute blessing of god yeah like i mean because yet we don't see the human life life expectancy like actually grow you see what i'm saying yeah like it's now, actually... i think th- i think there's some limitations for which god is not going to let us trespass that's just yeah. my personal okay. take yeah. on it i don't i don't think that god is going to uh I think that God has set parameters for some Certainly. of those things, right? Yeah. Um, but at the same time, yeah, the fact that like my shoulders go like, so I just, I, I've, I've got a shoulder thing. I think I've torn my rotator cuff. Um, there's surgery available to mm-hmm. me. I think mm-hmm. it's a direct blessing of yeah. God, whether those scientists recognized it or not when they, when they invented the surgery, like I think it's a direct blessing of God. He has given us the ability to understand the, name the, of the, the human body. Baptist hospital. <laughs> <laughs> Not for me, brother. I'm up in Michigan. <laughs> it's Dutch. It's Dutch. Yeah. Dutch hospital or, or St. Mary's Culver's. Culver's Culver's Hospital. Hospital. Um, Okay, so working through some of the natural stuff, like I want to, I want to maybe back up because one of the things, like as we're as we're thinking about this, um, one of the things you said before we went on that trajectory was um, Christ ushering in, right? So you gave me, you gave, I told you a while back, I like buckets. Give me, give me buckets and let me figure it out. Right. Right. So that was a good conversation we had. It was a, it was a really helpful yeah. conversation. So, um, in this, the buckets were, um, does Christ come back to a conquered world or does Christ come back to the, does Christ come back to the world to conquer? Right. Two major, two major thoughts. I, I, I cannot land perfectly in either one of those buckets. Right. Like I can't come to a world that has been, conquered because really first Corinthians 15 is one, but then also like the way, even, even the natural things that have been mentioned here that are, that are evidences of the curse. I'm not convinced. And I think you've even made reference to the natural limitations. Like there are things that God has, God is essentially saying, you're not, you're not trespassing there. Sure. Right. There are things that simply will not come to pass uh, up until Christ's return. Mm-hmm. Right. And then the other one is, well, does he come back to a conquered world? Well, if that's if that's my optimism of the church's conquest being successful, like I don't believe that the Great Commission is going to be a failure. Like that that's really where I am. And I and I understand the pessimistic amillennialist is not going to say the Great Commission is a failure either. But I do think the way in which the world is transformed, and by that I am making reference to the people, not necess- not you know, that's primarily what I'm dealing with. The way in which God conquers the world through the Great Commission. Like I'm, I'm convinced on the last day there will be far more Christians than not mm. that's present re- on the earth, present on the moment. earth at that moment. Okay, I think that's a helpful distinction. Um, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, but I mean, full disclosure, I, I'm of the persuasion that that Christ will save more than will be damned in total percentages. Like if it's fifty one fifty, so be it. But I'm I'm convinced that it's more, not less. Yeah. Um. So you know, that's an interesting conversation to get in with Calvinists, yeah, really but. But I, that that's where I am. So, and I've been there for a long time. I just I just think that that's that's the way I read. So, all that to say that when I'm looking at the world, I I believe I'm looking at a world that has been, um, and a people that have been altered by the gospel. That the the Great Commission's been successful. That our prayers of Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, it have have been profitable. Mm. Like, I don't know, I don't know a better way to say that it's been profitable. You've made reference to a couple of verses that I think have been helpful, which is, um, the glory will fill the earth, like the waters, the sea, the leaven will work itself out, like all of those things. But one of the, one of the major distinctions that I have is, okay, so, so what then that being the case, so what then does Christ come back to usher in? Mm -hmm. Like what's the dividing line between the bucket over here that says Christ comes back to a conquered world and the bucket over here that says uh, Christ comes back to a conquered world. Yeah. Where, so the, the, let's take the optimistic amillennial view, view and the post view. What would be the distinctions of what's in, what are in those buckets? Like, yeah. 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 Let's do some bucket work. So, um, so thinking about those buckets, like number one, it's not, it's not a complete totality on either side. Right. right. So like the, 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 the conversation you're referencing, I think it was Voss and Hodge. Uh, the old the old Princeton crowd that used to yeah. they, the, the the story goes I think it's apocryphal because Voss was the one who brought in Amillennial thought for sure yeah, yeah yeah or at least you know kind of systematized it in yeah. a way that hadn't been done so 
So the, 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 the dialogue, so the story goes, was that one would say um, Christ comes back to a redeemed world and the other one said, no, Christ comes to redeem the world. Right. You know, kind of that, that whole that whole chestnut. Neither of them would say, like, on the one hand, that the entirety of the world, as in every man, woman and child are going to be redeemed when Christ returns. Yeah, that they're I all saved. Well, yeah. Right. But neither is the other side saying that they're all going to be lost when Christ returns and he has to right. re- come. So, like, there's there's a little bit of a middle on both of those views. So the two buckets would look like this. So um, Christ, well, let's say this. We agree that at the end of time, there's going to be a point at which, and this is most, not all, but most would agree that Satan's going to be released. He's going to make a big ruckus. He's going to deceive the nations. They're going to rise and revolt, and he's going to squash them. And then Christ returns, and with the breath of his mouth, he crushes the serpent. Final, Once and finally, he ushers in the eternal state. uh, Sin and death are destroyed, etc. The whole 1 Corinthians 15 uh, paradigm. So if that's what Christ returns to, the whole question is, what does the world look like right before that? Right. That's that, that to me is the whole question is when I, I would actually say that's the major question between optimistic awe and post. Yeah. Just just. Flat but, that, out. but that again yeah. is the kingdom. Yeah. What does the kingdom look like? Yeah. Are we going to look around and see 12 Christians on a mountain fending off the pagan hordes that are you know <laughs> trying to murder them? And then and then. uh Gandalf rides over the hill. Stop. Oh, wow. Sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm You're sorry. You're mixing metaphors. I did. I did. Goodness. That was necessary. Though. That's yeah. problematic. Is the, tur- is, the tur- is the kingdom a persecuted minority at that point? Or right. is the kingdom a victorious, um, in- or a, 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 is it victorious in this world prior to right. Christ, prior to Satan's rise and then Christ's defeat of him and re- final return? Right. That's, that's, that, that to me is the whole question. Oh, were you asking for an answer? Yeah. Oh, you were looking at me. I thought yeah. you were just asking me to define the buckets. I, so those are our buckets. Yeah. So so I guess if I'm if let me ask it this way, the optimistic amillennial view essentially has a, the ramification of of a victorious conquest mm-hmm. hitting the civil hitting the 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 government. Fair. All, all, yeah. Yeah, everything, yeah. every sphere. All, all, all sphere of society, yeah. And you can correct me if I'm wrong here, but the, the post-mill position essentially says that part of the mission is the reform of the of the You mean the Amil well. position? No, no. The, so, the, so the Amil position, is, the optimistic Amil is this is a ramification of the conquest. Fair? Oh, okay, okay, yeah. yeah. Seeing the world, of, good works, good laws. Right, like that's a ramification of the, Christ, of, of, of the gospel going out you're but but even okay. but even yeah. then, and again, like th- this is going to come down to like what author are you reading? Most Amil guys would say though that's not the sign of the advance of the kingdom. Okay. The kingdom is not interested in the reform of society. The kingdom is interested in the reform of souls and the salvation of people. Okay. It is a spiritual reality. So that's so then like would you see this worldly manifestations of the advance of that kingdom? Sure, but that's not the kingdom. No, I agree. Agree. Okay. So I'm asking you, what's so that being the case? Do you have do you have something? So are you saying then that the post mill position would view that as part of the kingdom? Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, that's what I was getting at. The, 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 the question, I mean, like, I should have done this at the front end, but like, if you just look at some of those promises, like you mentioned Matthew 28. Sure. So the church is called to make disciples of all nations. And we agree that will happen. We're called to pray thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, which that was my, you know, snarky Twitter question was just like, is it, is it so radical to expect that that might happen? This is the Why question. Why would we classify that, that that has happened? This, well, because Christ commanded us to pray for it to happen. So we can say, like, is Christ's kingdom here? Well, yeah, he said so in, in Mark 13. Is it expanding? Well, yes, it is. Can we expect for it to come, be manifested and constituted here as it is in heaven? Which, mm. how is God's kingdom expressed in heaven? It seems it seems to be pretty dominant in heaven, right? Like, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I don't see a lot of opposition to the kingdom of God in heaven. He said to pray for that to happen on earth. The whole question is, when does that happen? Mm. Does it happen prior to his return or does it happen after his return? Everyone agrees it's going Everybody to happen. Everybody agrees it's going right? to happen. But yeah. the, the amillennial camp would say, yes, we are to pray for those things and we are not to expect them to be accomplished until he returns. If anything, we're to expect it to look like they're not being accomplished progressively until he returns. The post millennial position would say, no, we should expect those things to be accomplished here. The earth to be redeemed, not fully, not completely. We're not trying to mix categories and overrealize our eschatology as the accusation is. But can we expect the kingdom of God to actually come as he taught us to pray? And to me, that's not that's not that absurd of a question to ask is if Christ looked at his disciples and said, you pray for this here. Um, is it is it is it wrong headed to expect that we might we might see that accomplished because the, the 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 impetus wasn't the Lord's prayer is not pray for my kingdom to come when I return, but expect expect it to fail in the meantime. 
It's pray now my kingdom come, my will be done on earth. Again, consummatively as it is in heaven. How, how big is the kingdom in heaven? It seems quite dominant. So paint me the picture of what you view the day before the trumpet blows. I don't what know. Does, <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know. Uh, this, 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 sorry, know. this is actually a really important point because there, there needs to be a real sense of, of charity in the midst of these conversations because there really, there really is an I don't know. Like I'm not saying, Absolutely. I'm not saying let's go pan mill, but I am saying we need to understand that what we are doing is looking at what the Lord's revealed to us and doing our best to appropriately apply yeah. those things yeah, to resolve. I'm saying like, what do you do with North Korea? Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm I'm being literal. I'm being serious. I like, think I think North Korea is one of those enemies that Christ said He's going to crush under His feet. Yeah. And and First Corinthians tells me He's going to progressively keep crushing those enemies under His feet until the last one standing's death, mm-hmm. and then He'll crush it and He will in His return. So um, when you, when you look to it kind of goes back to what you were saying, Lawson, like, you know, you don't know if it's a 51-49 split. Sure. Like, what does that look like when Christ returns? Is there going to be like 99% of the globe is is redeemed? Or is it like, is it like a slim majority? I don't know, but I, I agree that I think we should expect a majority, and I would even say a dominant majority of people to be saved by the time Christ returns. And you hear that, and I know the reaction that people have when you hear that. That might take a while. They could. Um, it could it, also it could also not. It could also not. It could also like not. I, I saw the picture on Twitter the other day. It was the uh, it was the Wright brothers' flight, yeah. and then it was Neil Armstrong walking on the moon, and it was just pointing out that's sixty six years apart. Now that's just human achievement. Sixty six <laughs> years. What can God do? Like mm-hmm. I, 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 my my plea would just be like, let's not limit God in that regard. Right. Could yeah. God in five years? Could we be looking back and saying, who would have thought? Right. Like the whole country bowed its knees. It happened in Nineveh. Why mm-hmm. would we doubt that yeah. God could do that now? That's not. That's not frivolous optimism. That's just recognizing God's done this literally a lot of times. Yeah. Um, yeah. We should not deny his ability to do it again. So, so it's not progressive through pragmatism at all. I mean, it can be no. a one moment and in, that's the in thing. spiritual reality. If, if, if I thought for a second that I can go out there and put hand to plow and force God's hand, mm. I, I would be foolish. Um, I know only a, only a miraculous regenerative regenerating work of the Holy Spirit can accomplish this thing in this world. And that's exactly why, like, I think this walks hand in hand with God's sovereignty. Only yep. God can accomplish this thing. Um, however, should I have absolute faith in what he seems to have promised clearly that he will accomplish? And that's really like, you know, you you asked earlier, like, what's the point? Like, what's how does this impact us believing this thing? That That's one of my concerns is that we not read scripture. And if it seems God makes a promise, which, again, we've walked through a couple of them that we not doubt his ability to yeah. or his will to. He said mm-hmm. he will. And I want to affirm that in every way I can. Like like Lawson said, humbly respectfully. Yeah. Um, I'm not trying to divide, divide churches over it, but at the same time, God, God said he's going to do miraculous things. And I want to see that. Yeah. We've got inside of our congregation, we have, we have pre mill, we have a mill and we probably have a couple of guys who would say that they're post mill. And so like you the, and a couple of folks stop the, um, <laughs> so the, but the major thing, the major thing that I, that I get to is, is do I, I believe that everyone I just mentioned, the pre-mill, I think probably the only thing we don't have is like the hardline dispensational pre-mill, right? So we've got the historic, we've got the, we've got the post. But in the midst of that, I believe all of those people believe the promises of God. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think maybe the distinction is where do we believe those will come to fruition? Yeah. Um, you yeah, know, I've heard a former pastor say if the church would just be obedient, Jesus could come back. Yeah. I think that's full of problems. Yeah. yeah. Agreed. And I yeah. think that's a lot of times, even in my own life where I'm at fault in my bias, mm. you know, that we, we need to do one, two, three, four, five, you know what I'm saying? Well, that's like, why it's interesting that a lot of the pushback against hopeful eschatology has been, it's trying to force the hand of God and accomplish the things of God by human hands and the missional call from, I'm not going to name names or anything like that, but like, since I've been a kid, the missional call was God hasn't returned because there's not enough missionaries yep. on the field. If we put more missionaries yep. on the field, the great commission would be accomplished and we did that, what is that if yeah, I'm trying to force God's hand? My first thought, like my first, as I was like developing eschatology years ago, was um, essentially believing that the reason Jesus hasn't come back is because we did not have enough missionaries on the field. Yep. Like there weren't enough people being reached. I think that's so prevalent. Yeah. No, it re- I really think it is. And so what, what is interesting is that the other side of this is, oh, you're trying to force this. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Like that's the, that's what's happening over here. Right. And instead what I'm, what the aim is, we're going to trust the sovereignty of God and the promises of God that they will actually come to fruition. Right. And so, all right, one last question on the last day, right? So would you say that on the last day, 
from the from both the optimistic awe and the post mill. Well, the optimistic awe is an obvious, but the post mill perspective that there will still be some wicked government. Some wicked governments. Yeah. That's that's a tough one. Um, yeah, that's a that's a that's a tough one. I think the I th- obviously we would agree. I think we would agree that the preponderance and majority of the governments have been brought under the bear of Christ. So, like, could there be one last North Korea? You know, kind of that, holding that was out. playing this off of his right, North kind of holding question. out, yeah, yeah. holding out right there at the very end, probably. Yeah, but but I would doubt it. Okay, on the on the on the on the sense of a government, and this we could get deep into the weeds a little bit on this one, but uh, but Christ said He's going to submit every ruler and authority and power as as He is consummating all things. I, I suspect that's going to include the beasts of this world. If I can hmm. make allusion, grab you some revelation. Yeah, yeah. So okay, that's that's helpful. So, um. I guess any any other questions, Blake? Sorry, you've been drinking your coffee. No, okay. So I guess so. My my final question here: You take the optimistic amillennial. Let's let's take all of the uh, all of the. Uh, yes. Yeah, I have a question. Okay, I got some. I all was he, just he got, on it. Yeah, all right, so stewed. You do you think though? Like you kind of mentioned it being a caricature of of the post mill position that we're trying to force the hand of God. Do you think that there are those whose motives are, from the outside looking in, it feels like there are those whose motives are not, let's take the gospel to everyone and let's just beat people into submission. Absolutely. Okay. So, like, uh, Absolutely. So like you're, you're mentioning, I mean, what was Protestant liberalism, <laughs> right? Like if, if not for a heretical perversion of post-millennial thought, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah, as best as I can tell, right? Yeah. If we can build some stuff, then we can accomplish X. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so that's definitely there. Okay. So like one of the things that I've always heard you say, Blake, and I'm always really grateful for it, your perspective is unique here because you're, you've are you been a teacher in a really difficult place. Yeah. And what you what you always hear, and this is what's so interesting, what you always heard and what I think you often kicked against and appropriately so, was we just need another hospital, we need another government program, right. we need another of, you know, another school, better education, more wealth distribution, and everything will be fine. Right. And I think one of the dangers, like you just mentioned, one of the dangers of uh, abusing how the kingdom expands is by saying, we just need all of these things and then we'll live in a golden age. And I, w- I do want to talk about the golden age for just a second. I'm keeping you for a long time. You're good. Um, I, I, again, you guys flew me in for this. Yeah, yeah. So it was a, it was a $10,000 dollar round trip. Yeah. Thank you first, to all of our subscribers, class, by the way. Thank only you, first yeah. class. Thank you for all 12 of our subscribers that... Uh, he had three meals. In yeah. His, in his <laughs> uh, but, but like that perspective is an abuse. Yeah. An absolute abuse of... What is number one, the weapons of warfare we've been given. It's yeah. a ne- it's a neglecting of the weapons of warfare we've been given and an expectation that through natural means. Well, I'll say it this way, that flesh will give birth to spirit. Yeah. And it's the, it goes it goes hand in hand with what you're talking about with numbers a minute ago. Right. Yeah. Like, is it is it wrong to talk about numbers? No. But are there probably a ton of abuses I could point out with 100%. numbers? Of course. Yeah. But that doesn't mean you just go the other way and say numbers don't matter. It's great that we have a yeah. church of five people and we're dying. You know, that, that that's not good. Yeah, either. yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but that's kind of, I guess, my argument is like, and you may, this may be where you're headed, was like, even if the people who are making the hospitals and building the government have really great theology, like they're not theological liberals. Mm. Like we're still, it's still a problematic place, right? And there are still people, it seems like it's not a caricature completely because there are people propagating even now who we would say have good, better theology, propagating like, Let's build systems and kind of getting the cart before before the horse instead of saying like we need hearts to change. For sure. So like I, I've got an example. I think this might be along the lines of what you're talking about. So there there was a recent push in in our town um, where uh, I got to be really careful. So there, there was there were some local agencies, governmental agencies that were talking about preventing um, mainly crime, but also like, you know, community uh disintegration and crime and all the attendant circumstances preventing that through education so like you look at something like that and i had some really good talks with some of our city leaders about it and the the whole question is like is it good for people to be educated yeah and like even with a christian education for sure and yet there's an underlying root there that unless one is redeemed one is not going to bear good fruit so I i think what you're pushing in on is there's there's a core there's a core here which we can't neglect which is only redeemed men and women can do good and god honoring things right? right the 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 man of the flesh cannot please god um 
But then outside of that, would there be attendant fruit? And this is where you get the whole conversation of like there is there is Christianity and then there is nominal Christianity, which kind of springs off from the sides of it. Um, but the nominal Christianity is always the product of the true Christianity. Right. So the, 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 the solution is never to shrink Christianity back, right? There's always going to be nominals. And, and to an extent, I think we should just ignore the nominal Christianity. Um, is it better that they're kind of halfway acting in Christianly fashion, right? Like they're not breaking into buildings and stuff. Well, that's, that's great. But we're still about the business of redemption. Yeah, they're, no they're still one damned, can, right. even if they don't yeah. murder people. Right, they're still yeah. not pleasing God, right? right? Even even their lack of crime, is it better for, is it just tangibly better for people that they're not committing crimes? Sure. Yes, but ultimately, what what are we about? We're about the salvation of men and women. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I think it's I think it's a solid point. That, the, the example I always go back to is you had, uh, oh, goodness, was it Augustine and Jerome, I believe it was, when Rome was falling? Oh. Um, so you had Jerome, which... You know, he essentially his reaction to Rome falling and, you know, obviously they blamed it on the Christians in large part. His his reaction was to retreat to the hills and go into a cave. Hmm. Um, Augustine, on the other hand, for all his flaws, you could point out Augustine's uh, reaction was to write one of the, you know, thickest, meatiest <laughs> theological treatises ever written by a Christian. Hmm. Right. So like there's there's two reactions to seeing those things in this world. I think ours is engagement, not yeah. retreat. Of course. Mm. Certainly. All right. The um the natural ramification of a of a growing kingdom, mm-hmm. right? Um, that many argue, and I, I even some of the things that I've read on on Twitter as of late, like as I probed the internet, mm. um, was okay. Let's talk about the golden age. Yeah. Okay. So you and I have talked about this a little bit, and we have difficult. Don't really like the terminology, but in regard to like a golden age here, I think one of the misconceptions of of most people who hold to a post-millennial view is the idea that we're going to, like, I think the language is we're going to usher in the kingdom. And mm. you've already ascribed that to, to Christ. Christ is the one who ushers in the kingdom, but the kingdom does advance, right? right? And so what the golden age doctrine, I mean, I would almost place it as a doctrine. Like when I hear it used, I know exactly what I'm thinking about. It's a category. So, so when we think of a golden age, which is like, in theory, a a time of unique peace, a time of unique... um, You're referencing... um, You're referencing Israel's pinnacle moment in the Old Testament. I mean, the Golden Age is a reference, right? Am I I, I speaking correctly? God's God's people's pinnacle moment? No, I'm saying like the Golden Age, when somebody says the Golden Age to me, like I think of like Solomon reigning and ruling over the entire expanse and like all of that had come to fruition... For the Commonwealth of Israel, yeah, no, uh, you're you're referring uh, yeah. more to like the promises that yeah. that points to, right? Like the beating yeah, the plowshares sure, sure, sure. or yeah, beating yeah. the swords into plowshares right, and right. all that. Yeah, yeah. So I'm I'm referring to that, but the, the kingdom the, in a sense yeah, yeah, yeah. is at peace at that. that moment. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can yeah. see that. I can see that as an illustration, certainly. The um, but like in that era, so like, what level of <laughs> <laughs> we always get to like. Josh Hardenfast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Write this, down this on is, tablets. Hey, make it known. You know what? If you're, if you're regularly on a YouTube channel called Eschatology Matters, I get to ask you whatever I want. I need hard and fast numbers right now. No, no, no. But, I, but, but my thought is in regard to the golden age is do you subscribe or do you expect or does the post-millennialist, uh, the normative view, expect a golden age in the sense where there will be peace, there will be harmony, right? There will be very little, I, I would, I'm not even going to say crime, but I would say a, a sin isn't defeated in the golden age. Right. Right. Okay. So walk me through that. Let me just, I'm just going to do that. Walk yeah. me through golden age. And then, so, yeah. Yeah. Golden age. And, and again, like, like you said, this is a really hard one because different guys have written on the golden age in different ways. It's kind of, yeah, like I've read, I've read some golden age stuff. That's like, Nobody's out, out sitting there. anymore. Yeah, it's it, it, it's it's not unlike the the great apostasy. I don't like the language of a great apostasy on the amillennial side of things, right? Because that's referring to the fact that Satan's released and there is a great deception followed by revolt, and that's right. what they're referring to as a great apostasy. But I've read some writers on the great apostasy. It's like, whoa, that's not what I'm talking about. So yeah. that's why I'm kind of cautious with that language of of golden age. But in general, I think I think this is the whole question is like just to make it really simple. Um, if Christ says to pray that his kingdom come and his will be done on earth as it is in heaven, 
And if we're seeing that progressively realized that his kingdom is coming and will being done, what might it look like if Christ's will is being done on earth as it is in heaven? Right. And again, with all the caveats, not perfect. Every single person is not redeemed. There's still sin and suffering in this world. Yes. There's still unregenerate people. Right. Yeah. Uh, like so Christ has not returned and consummated everything yet. But if his will is being done, what might that look like? Yeah. It probably look like a lot of peace. It probably oh, looked yeah, like a yeah, lot yeah. of prosperity. If, if we just said that one of the tangible benefits of God's uh, work through the kingdom in this world is the fact that I might have shoulder surgery to fix my shoulder. What might that look like when his kingdom has expanded further? Yeah, that's not to say God's winning back territory. Don't get me wrong. But like if God's will and kingdom are being realized in this world progressively and steadily, and we just said it's better now than it used to be. What might that look like if time progresses and God's pleased to tarry? I think that it might look like a golden age. I think that's a good stopping point because we have running water here and I need to use it. <laughs> <laughs> so in conclusion, I have a Bible verse, this man, just... Philippians two <laughs> verses nine through 11. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of of God the Father. So I'd like to thank my fellow elders, Lawson Harlow and Blake McCullough, and my good friend, Dr. Josh Howard, for the time spent today. Fellas, open up and say, ah, uh, mill or post mill. <laughs> my brothers and my friends. I thought he was going to do amen. I God, did too. Yeah, amen would have been better. Lawson, thanks for getting a little bit darker shirt. Mm. I was distracted. It was a mock. All right, I want to talk about my shirt from Sunday. Oh, oh my gosh. You, you know the title? I'll save it. <laughs> I want to talk this about my shirt. going in my notes. Your shirt? I, yeah, I want to talk about my shirt from Sunday. So I wasn't preaching on Sunday. Blake was mm. preaching. So, and the 30% of the sermon I heard was good. It was short. What was it? How long it was, was it? 45 minutes. I Whoa, checked it this bro, morning. for you, oh, that's... I don't know. Yeah. Um, so... I wore Beth. Beth bought me all new shirts this summer, and there was one shirt that I hadn't worn as of yet because he hates it. Because because I hate it. She's mm. not gonna listen. That's true. Um. So it's a what color is the shirt? It's like coral. A good color. Coral. So anyway, you, I wear I wear you said the shirt. peach. I think it was pinkish. It's yeah. a pink shirt. Right. And I don't hate on pink shirts. I grew up wearing pink shirts, and that was fine with me. But I'm a grown man now. That seems like what coral usually is. Is like. Trying not to say it's a pink shirt. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So I wear this shirt and I'm wearing shorts too. So I was trying to decide where the line was. But but I felt I felt immodest the whole day. And so I got home and the first thing I did was I changed my clothes. But but I think our definition of immodest, right, is it's like drawing attention to self. Everyone who talked to me said something about the shirt I had on. Mm. I was like, I don't like this. Yeah. So I think that the shirt, I told Beth when I got home, I said, this shirt's immodest. She said, Lawson, it fits fine. I was like, no, 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 no. It's an immodest shirt. It's drawing attention to me because it's so bright. <laughs> so I should not wear bow ties. I, See, here's the difference. I had that color in my shirt, and I felt fine. Mm. My conscience was violated. Yeah, so it's What's not, sad is my conscience <clears throat> was actually violated. It's not <laughs> immodest, then. It's just that you think it's immodest, and so if you do, then you can't wear it. Well, you can wear it at the Lost City this week, but you can't wear it to church. <laughs>